Hello students, this is Dr. Clark. I am going to try to record my lecture today through Zoom. We'll see how it goes. I think it might have some advantages, we'll see. Just one brief announcement before we begin. Any outline, rough draft, abstract idea about your paper that you want to have me review before it's due, please send to me today by the end of the day, and I will get feedback to you by the end of the day, Friday. So again, those papers are due by the end of the day on Wednesday, April 15th. And if you have any questions in the meantime, please just let me know. And I will look forward to reviewing any outlines or rough drafts you send me. Okay, now I'm going to try to share my screen and start my slideshow. <clears throat> okay, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Catholics begin prayer with an invocation of the Trinity, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. But what in the world is it? What is the Trinity? That's the topic for today. I put here on the first slide the famous icon of the Trinity from the Russian iconographer Andrei Rublev. As I mentioned last lecture, it's a depiction of an event in Genesis where Abraham entertains three strangers that turn out to be either three messengers from God or a manifestation of God himself. Christians have seen in this passage much more of the latter and have taken this event to be a foreshadowing or a manifestation of the Trinity even in the Old Testament. The first point that I wanted to bring up is the first point that Michael Himes brings up in his chapter on the Trinity, namely that the Trinity is not just one more belief among many. It's not just one more item on a list of beliefs that Christians happen to subscribe to. Christians believe everything in terms of the Trinity. It is the overarching context. It is the foundation for every other belief. And in this sense, it's kind of a framework for every Christian belief. Everything that Christians believe, in a sense, fits within one or another category of the Trinity. Christians believe in a God who creates. Everything in creation, everything that we see, is in a sense a outpouring of God the Father, the creation of God who brings forth everything into being. This God, however seeks to redeem the human race. The whole Bible is, in a sense, a story of redemption, and everything that Christians believe about God's intentions in intervening in history, choosing a people, becoming a human, dying for our sins, fits into the category of God the Son, the one who redeems us. So God creates, God redeems, but God also sanctifies. God makes us holy, God heals us, God makes us whole. And this fits mainly into the category of the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, who comes, establishes a church, and brings about the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. So the Trinity is the framework for everything that Christians believe, but it's also the framework for what Christians believe about everything. Everything that Christians believe to be true bears some relation to one or another person of the Trinity. The Trinity is the context for everything that Christians believe. And this is why Christian profession of belief in the creed, either the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, is structured according to Trinitarian categories. Christians profess their belief in all the particular things that they believe are necessary for their salvation in terms of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is the structure, the outline of everything Christians believe. The Trinity ultimately is not simply a description of God, it is the definition of God, 
for Christians. The Trinity is who God is. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is a union of three persons. So the Trinity is not simply a way God organizes himself and organizes his activity. God is not composed of members. The Trinity is not some divine assembly, as in the Enuma Elish, a collection of different gods working together to do what they do. Neither is the Trinity a division of parts of God. Oftentimes people think of the Trinity as just sort of the way God divides himself, three faces, three aspects. This is to divide God within himself. And so the God, the Father, is really only one third of God, and likewise with the other persons of the Trinity. So we can't think of the Trinity in terms of a pie chart, nor is the Trinity merely three modes of God, like a transformer toy. There's one God, but God transforms from the Father into the Son. God transforms from the Son into the Holy Spirit. God can transform into either one of these three persons, but underlying it is the same device. This is a little harder to understand. It's a little bit sort of more, it's closer to the truth, you might say, of Christian belief. But it makes God into something that necessarily must change. If God is, is one device that takes three different forms. The Trinity is not just three modes or uses of God, three activities. It's hard to talk about the Trinity. It's hard to explain the Trinity in ways that don't lead to one of these misapprehensions. And as a way of kind of demonstrating that, I have for you here a little video I thought I would incorporate in today's lecture, a humorous video created by a group of Lutherans. And the premise of it is that St. Patrick has appeared in Ireland <clears throat> and is trying to explain the Trinity to the native indigenous Irish folk. And you have here the twins here, uh, I believe uh, Donal and Connell, uh, and they will be discussing the Trinity with St. Patrick. Okay, Patrick, tell us a bit more about this Trinity thing. Yeah, Patrick, tell us. But remember that we're simple people without your fancy education and books and learning, and we're hearing about all time. So try to keep it simple. Oh, Patrick? Yeah, real simple, Patrick. Sure, there are uh, three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, yet there is only one God. Don't get what you're saying here, Patrick. Not picking up what you're laying down here, Patrick. Could you use an analogy, Patrick? Sure. Uh, the Trinity is like uh, water and how you can find water in three different forms, liquid and ice and vapor. That's modalism, Patrick. What? Modalism, an ancient heresy confessed by teachers such as Noetus and Sibelius, which espouses that God is not three distinct persons, but that he merely reveals himself in three different forms. This heresy was clearly condemned in Canon 1 at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and those who confess it cannot rightly be considered a part of the Church Catholic. Come on, Patrick! Yeah, get it together, Patrick! Uh, okay, uh, then the Trinity is like uh, the sun in the sky, where you have the star, and the light and the heat. Oh, Patrick. Come on, Patrick. That's Arianism, Patrick. Arianism? Yes, Arianism, Patrick. A theology which states that Christ and the Holy Spirit are creations of the Father and not one in nature with him. Exactly like how heat and light are not the star itself, but are merely creations of the star. That's a bad analogy, Patrick. You're the worst, Patrick. All right, sorry. The Trinity is like... Uh, this three-leaf clover here. I'm gonna stop you right there, Patrick. Yeah, hold your horses, Patrick. You're about to confess partialism. Partialism? Yes, partialism. A heresy which asserts that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not distinct persons of the Godhead, but are different parts of God, each composing one-third of the divine. And who confesses the heresy of partialism? The first season of the cartoon program Voltron, where five robot lion cars together to form one giant robot samurai, obviously. 
I've never heard of Voltron. Of course you haven't. It's not going to exist for another 1,500 years now, Patrick. Yeah, get with the program, Patrick. I mean, really, Patrick. I'm going to stab you in the face, Patrick. Okay, that was probably a bit much. All right, I'll try again. Uh, the Trinity is like how the same man can be a husband and a father and an employer. Moralism again. All right, then it's like the three layers of an animal. Partialism revisited. Fine. The Trinity is a mystery which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood only through faith and is best confessed in the words of the Athanasian Creed, which states that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance, that we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. Well, why didn't you just say that, Patrick? Yeah, quit beating around the bush, Patrick. Now let's all put on some giant green foam hats, get riotously drunk, and vomit in the Chicago River to celebrate our conversion. Okay. A very funny video. My daughter's laughing at it right now. <clears throat> and by the way, some of my colleagues address me as, oh, Patrick. So a classic video about the Trinity demonstrating how difficult it can be to provide an explanation for the Trinity that doesn't fall into purely human modes of understanding it, and by implication, one of these uh, heretical presentations of it. So where can we begin to explain the Trinity? Well, a good place to begin would be at the beginning, at the creation itself. Christians read Genesis, which does seem to have some odd language about the one who creates, namely, a God who has to speak in order to create. One might ask why? God is all powerful. Why not just think creation into being? Why not just do it? Why does he need to do anything external? Why does he need to say anything? But we hear in Genesis that God creates by using words, by speaking. Speaking itself suggests a kind of differentiation within God. One who understands, one who decides to speak, one who speaks words external to himself that then bring forth creation. But of course, these words are not external to God. They're a part of God. So even here we see God acting in ways that suggest both distinction and differentiation within God and nevertheless God's own unity. Creation is an active expression of God's own self-understanding. This is what words are. This is what expressions are. You understand something, uh, you form a thought, and then you express it, and you express it through words by speaking. This is how God creates. An interesting portrayal. Even more suggestive is the use of the first person plural in Genesis 1.26, when he says, let us make human beings in our own image and likeness. Why? Why say let us? Why not just say, I will now make human beings in my own image and likeness? Why is there this sense of plurality within God? Why does he use this pronoun us? Christians, of course, see in this already an intimation of the Trinity, the differentiation within God himself while remaining fully one. So the conclusion from Genesis is that God creates through discourse. God creates by speaking. God is himself essentially a discursive being. He speaks. He speaks to himself using words that are expressions of his own self-understanding. And that God is not merely an I, an isolated being, enclosed within himself, but God is somehow essentially from the beginning an us, a community. But of course, for Christians, it is Jesus who ultimately reveals the doctrine of the Trinity. How so? Well, as we mentioned before, Jesus' followers come to believe that Jesus is God in human form. They see in Jesus more than simply a prophet or a messenger, but God himself. Given that conviction, what did Jesus himself do to suggest that God is not simply a single, simple monad, but rather a relation of persons? Well, Jesus prays. If Jesus is God, why does he need to pray? 
To whom does he pray? Well, he prays to someone other than himself. That alone is just a very deep, profound mystery. Christians did not shy away from confessing that Jesus is God, even after experiencing his own prayer to someone other than himself, someone that he calls Father. There's two chief connotations to this title, Father. Origination, the Father is the one from whom one is descended, from whom one came, and also care and love, parental concern. It's summon, it, it is something that summons up an experience that we all have of coming from somewhere and coming from someone who loves us and who cares for us. So even on the surface, Jesus's life and actions are not merely about displaying divine attributes, but about relating to God as someone distinct from oneself. And Christians come to believe that this act of relating is not merely something Jesus does as a human being. It's also a mark of God's own deepest nature. So if Jesus is God, Jesus is also distinct from the Father, and yet completely united to the Father. So we hear passages like this from the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And even more strongly, I and the Father are one. So alongside this discourse, this address, Jesus praying to the Father, you have the assertion by Jesus that he and the Father are one and the same. And then finally, at the end of the Gospel of John, you have St. Thomas, the Apostle, doubting Thomas, confessing that Jesus is Lord, the title reserved for God alone. And almost as if to clarify what he could possibly mean, we have him say, my Lord and my God. Well, that same Apostle John who wrote that gospel also asserts that God is love. What could that possibly mean? Does it mean that just God is loving? It's a characteristic of God? Well, no, it's more than that. Is it that loving is something God happens to do from time to time? No, it's not that either. This absolute predication, love to God, is something that describes who or what God is, essentially, in his very nature. God is not just someone who loves. God is not just a lover. God is himself love. The phrase can often be interpreted metaphorically, poetically, but it is really meant to be very straightforward and literal. Christians believe that God is love. So this is perhaps the best conceptual place to begin to explain what the Trinity is. First, you have to ask yourself a question, what is love? You know, like that old disco song, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. It's a very natural question. Well, if God is love, then tell me what love is. What are you saying here by asserting that God is love? Christians, of course, believe that it is Jesus who fundamentally and decisively reveals what love is. Again, St. John the Apostle writes in his first letter, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So this becomes the fundamental reference point for Christians of what love is. Everything else is kind of derivative. We compare other loves, other manifestations of love to this definitive, final, and essential act of love. No greater love hath man than this, to lay down his life for his friends. So God himself shows us what love is through the cross by laying down his life. And so Jesus reveals through this act that God is nothing but love. God is not only someone who loves his people and loves creation, but it's deeper than that. God is himself love. That's what John says later in his first letter, that God is love. And we'll return to that verse in a little bit. There's some really deep, and here's where the mind-bending implications come into play. If God is love, and God is one, and God is eternal, then what does that say about the metaphysical status of love? Well, it implies that God never begins loving. This should just read, God never begins loving. There's your uh, typo for the day. 
God never begins loving. Rather, God loves from all eternity. God does not create in order to have something to love. Even before God created, God is love. So how could he love without anything outside of him to love unless that capacity to love lies within himself? So if God is love, then in a sense, there has to be some differentiation within God where from all eternity, God is able to love through a distinction or differentiation within himself. And this implies that God is not primarily a substance. God is not first some substrate, some thing that you can then apply characteristics to. He is not something that exists and then acts but God is somehow essentially the act of love. God is first and foremost an activity, even before he is a substance. God is not primarily a thing, but an act. And this can get very deep, and Thomas Aquinas explores this extensively among others. But the way Aquinas puts it is that without any potentiality within himself, without any ability to become something he is not, God is in himself pure act. Pure actuality might be a better translation. God is first and foremost an act, and only in reference to that act, that act of love, can we then refer to God as something, as an object we can think about. But nevertheless, love implies relation. You can't love without there being something to love, Love exists only because you have a relation between more than one thing. And so relation somehow is a part of God's essence, according to the Christian faith. And this is really the basis for asserting that God is a unity of subsistent relations. Relations that are eternal, that are in a sense more real than the poles of the relation. God is a communion of persons. The Trinity. All right, back to analogies then. The human mind really can't understand this in itself, at least here and now, and so we have to refer to things from our own world to describe the Trinity, hence the titles Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I just wanted to point out that these terms themselves are analogical. We take them from our own reality, from our own experience of having a father, the uh, worldly experience of sons coming from fathers, but these are not something uh, essential to the reality of the Trinity. They're just our labels. And Christians attach uh, more authority to these labels because of the way in which the Trinity was revealed in history. So Jesus, the Son of God, calls God his Father. And so this then is the primary title for the one from whom the Son is begotten. And likewise, the Holy Spirit, we take this term spirit and we take the adjective holy to refer to that life within Jesus himself that he bestows upon his followers that allow for human beings like you and me to participate in this eternal activity of love. But Christians along the way have tried to explain the relation between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by using other realities from the world around us such as fire. St. Patrick mentions this one kind of in reference to the sun, but uh, Sri also mentions it. So like fire can have both a flame, a heat, and a light that are all part of one and the same phenomenon. So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three uh, aspects or qualities of the same phenomenon. Now St. Pat are the uh, uh, two gentlemen St. Patrick was talking to say this is Arianism because the heat and the light come from the flame, are products of the flame, but nevertheless Christians have used this analogy along the way. Uh, maybe one that comes a little closer is the analogy of language, of speech, of saying something. In order for anyone to say something, there has to be someone who says it, a speaker. There has to be content to what they say, so that would be the speech itself, the language that is articulated. But then the act of speaking itself is uh, its very physical. So there's vibrations going on in the throat. There's breath coming out of the mouth. There is, in a sense, a certain physical vehicle 
the physical act of speaking that mediates the content that's coming from the speaker. And so there you might have an analogy of the Trinity there, the Father being the one who speaks, the Son or the Word, which is that which is spoken, and then the act of speech itself, the act of speaking, which is the Holy Spirit. Or back to St. Patrick, three leaves on a clover. This is perhaps the most primitive of the analogies where you have one plant, but a differentiation even in that unity of three different leaves that you can differentiate from each other. This is partialism. Uh, according to the to the video. So you can use these analogies, but just remember that all these analogies are always going to be more incorrect than correct. So it's sort of like a child drawing a picture of a person. You can tell that they're trying to draw a picture of a person, but you wouldn't say in any respect that it perfectly uh, images what it's trying to uh, portray. And we should remember that old uh, adage, all analogies limp. What does that mean? Well, analogies can take you somewhere, but they only do so in a kind of faltering way. They only do so with significant flaws. And especially with regard to any language about God, particularly the Trinity, you should always remember that in any of these analogies, there's always going to be more dissimilarity than similarity. So like that drawing on the right, there's more that's dissimilar between that portrayal and what it's portraying, then there is similarity. It can nevertheless point you to uh, some reality beyond itself, but only in a very obscure way, and only in a way where you can sort of say, this is almost like a symbol or a sign of what it's portraying and not really a reflection. The best analogy, of course, is the analogy of love. And this is the analogy that St. Augustine uses as Sri recounts in his chapter, and also that Father Himes makes much of in his chapter on the Trinity. The Trinity is really the differentiation required by love. If God is love, then that itself implies a sort of distinction between a lover, the beloved, and the love that is shared between the lover and the beloved. In this way, Christians would say God is a communion of love, but a specific kind of love. So there are different Greek words for love along the way. There's eros, there's philia. Eros, of course, being erotic love. Philia being the love of friendship. But agape is distinct. Agape is the absolute unconditional love that characterizes God's love for creation. The way that Himes puts it is that it's the love of complete and utter self-gift. Uh, where one gives oneself in one's entirety to another. And the traditional uh, Christian or Catholic uh, articulation of this is that it's the, the love that loves things because of God and for God's sake. So it's a kind of tapping into the love from which all things come. I love this expression from Himes. The Trinity implies that from all eternity, God is an enormous explosion of agape. And that agape, or that this love, is the self-gift which grounds all that exists. So it is the love that is the basis for all reality. And C.S. Lewis has this nice quote, which uh, Sri incorporates into his chapter. In Christianity, God is not a static thing, not even a person, but a dynamic pulsating activity, a life, almost a kind of drama almost a kind of dance, an eternal dance. Notice the dynamic quality of these descriptions of the Trinity. So God isn't just someone who's there from all eternity, just as stuck as a kind of static being. God is an eternal activity, an eternal dynamic movement, a movement of love. Okay, now what are the implications for human existence of this teaching? Well, if, as Genesis says, we are made in the image of, of God, we are made then in the image of eternal self-giving love. We are made by love. God is love. We are made by means of love, through love. And the ultimate point of all creation is love. So we are made for love. Love is, you might say, the ultimate rationale for everything and the ultimate end or purpose for everything which makes sense because everything comes from it. 
and everything is sustained through it. This also implies that our individuality, our distinction from one another is, is not an end in itself. That we are separate individual beings is really only a precursor to our capacity for relationship. Uh, we are individuals only as conditions of possibility for entering into love. We are made in the image and likeness of the Trinity, written into the fabric of our being, therefore, is this law of self-giving. This is Sri's expression. And he goes on to elaborate, only in self-giving love, only when we live for God and for others, will we find happiness. Will we find the happiness we were made for? So this has a practical implication in that if you're looking for the meaning of your life, and if God has anything to do with that, then it's really the love that God is that explains what you were for and is really the ultimate thing you're seeking. Uh, that's the only thing that you're really going to find rest in. It's what you were made for. It also has the implication, as Father Heim says, that to experience love, to participate in the activity of love, is to encounter God. So when people truly love each other, when agape is present between human beings, God is present there. This is how we find God, to love one another, to love one another as Christ has loved us. So when we see the love that was revealed to us in the cross manifest itself in the world around us, we are seeing God. And I'll uh, conclude this slide with a passage from another passage from the letter of 1 John. This is really the fuller context of the idea that God is love. And notice that it begins not with who God is, not with the commandment of God, how we're supposed to relate to God, but how we're supposed to relate to one another. St. John writes, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. So the possibility and the experience of love at a human level is really the primary and maybe even the exclusive entryway to God from a Christian point of view. And as Himes makes much of in this chapter, we don't have to perfectly understand who God is in order to love. It actually goes the other direction. The dynamic goes in the reverse direction. We understand who God is because we're capable of loving. So it's through the experience of love, the love that we know because of the cross, that we can come to encounter God in the world. And then Sri goes on to further specify that we only really find ourselves by giving ourselves away. Only in pouring our heart out to others do we truly find anything that is eternal. Only what is poured out truly remains. And I'll close with this quote, another one from C.S. Lewis. Nothing that you have not given away will really be yours. So this is really the practical uh, implication of the Trinity for human life, for human morality. Uh, it's the law of the gift, as Pope St. John Paul would say. Only in truly giving oneself away does one truly find oneself. Uh, because giving oneself away is really the ultimate activity of God himself. It's the ultimate nature of reality itself. And when we find a way to give ourselves truly, then we have found a way of being like God. And we found the purpose for our existence and we bring ourselves into line with the purpose of all creation. Okay, so that's enough about the Trinity. Uh, that's all we'll do. And now we have Easter break. And we, when we come back from Easter break, we'll talk about the Holy Spirit more specifically. What is this Holy Spirit? Where does it come from? What does it do? Uh, so have a blessed and happy Easter to everybody. And I will see you on the other side.